Okay. Uh, <coughs> good evening. Uh, last time uh, we discussed uh, simulation. So uh, <coughs> when we do Monte Carlo simulation, uh, first thing we need to consider is to generate a standard uniform random number, right? So how can we do that? Uh, actually, so the the simplest idea is this uh, linear convergential generator. So <coughs> what is this uh, uh, linear convergential uh, generator? Uh, it's a, uh, it just uh, follow this very simple formula, right? So <coughs> last time we explained this uh, uh, linear convergential generator. Uh, <coughs> We also uh, reviewed some very simple example about this uh, linear conversion generator, and I give you some uh, examples. And then uh, about this uh, uh, random number generator, you need to have the idea about period, right? So which means that actually uh, this generator will give you a, a sequence of uh, pseudo random numbers, but uh, when we talk about pseudo numbers, random numbers, which means that they're not really random. And uh, so this sequence of uh, numbers will repeat itself. Uh, and uh, so the length uh, of one repetition is called a period. Uh, these are important conceptions for uh, this uh, random number generator. And next, uh, we discuss how to generate arbitrary uh, random variable using a standard uniform, right? So the idea is pretty simple because we know that uh, the function of a uh, random, random variable is still a random variable. So then we think of uh, designing a function so that so this function of a standard uniform will have the distribution we wish to have. So then it boils down to finding the correct uh, function so that we can use this function of a standard uniform to have uh, the distribution we wish to have. Uh, we first discuss how to generate a Bernoulli random variable. So Bernoulli is the simplest one, and the idea is pretty simple. So because they just like a flip a coin, so then if standard uniform is between 0 and P, we let this uh, Bernoulli uh, to have value 1. If this standard uniform is between P and 1, so then this uh, uh, Bernoulli takes uh, value 0. And last time we discussed, so for, for such a thing, uh, it must have uh, the Bernoulli, uh, random, uh, Bernoulli distribution, so with parameter P. And uh, Next, we, gener we generalize this idea to an arbitrary discrete random variable. So to generate a, an arbitrary discrete random variable, uh, first, uh, we need to consider so the sighting like this. Uh, <coughs> we organize the all possible values so this uh, random variable x we take. We call them x0, x1, and so on. And uh, so this x0 is the smallest value, and uh, x1 is the second smallest value, and so on, right? And then uh, in this way, how can we generate uh, so uh, this uh, discrete random variable? Uh, the method is called discrete inverse transform method. And last time, we discussed that, and uh, we just need to follow this very simple expression. So, so first, we still need to generate a standard uniform random number, so which is this uh, capital U, and uh, we check the value of this random number if it is between f of x sub k minus 1 and f of uh, uh, f of x sub k. So here, what is this f, capital F? This capital F is the CDF of this x of this discrete uh, distribution. 
the CDF of this discrete distribution. We wish to generate something that has this CDF, right? So because this CDF is known, this capital F is known, so as long as so this uh, random number, uh, uniform random number takes value uh, within this interval, in this case, then we just let this random variable x takes value x of k, right? So this is a uh, <coughs> this is the per, uh, the discrete inverse transform method. The last time we discussed why uh, in this way, so this uh, capital X must have the desired uh, distribution. So uh, before we move on, maybe uh, let's check let's check several uh, two simple examples uh, for using this discrete unit or uh, discrete uh, inverse transform method. So the first example is like this. So this time, suppose suppose that we wish to generate a discrete uniform uh, random variable. So here, uh, this capital X uh, may take a value one, two, three up to n, and uh, it is discrete uniform in the sense that the probability that it takes any value k between one and n uh, with probability one over n. Right, uniform is uh, on the side. So there should be no probabilities should be equal. So now let's see uh, how to generate uh, so the value of this random variable x uh, using the discrete inverse transform method. Uh, so first, so we need to find out the, the CDF of this discrete uniform distribution, right? And then uh, according to the definition, uh, what is the probability that it takes a value less than or equal to k? So because uh, it takes the, the probability mass is like this, right? So it takes value less than or equal to k. It should be k over n. So it, it's just like this. And then according to, according to this expression, so which is the discrete inverse transform method, if u takes value uh, between this one and this one, then x should take value x sub k, right? So, so in, in, in this example, so which means that if u takes value between k minus 1 over n and k over n, then x should take uh, value k, right? So this is uh, just a straightforward thing. And actually, uh, up to this step, we are able to generate the value of x. But for this example, we can uh, further simplify the procedure a little bit. We can do a bit more. So <coughs> you see that So this is uh, what we have so far, right? And actually, from this step, you see, if uh, u is between so this number, uh, this value and this value, and actually, so we can we can uh, time n on both sides. So this so which means that it's n times u must between uh, k minus 1 and k, right? So why bother to do so? Because uh, you see, if this n u is within this interval, then x should take value k, right? So in this, in this case, you can see that actually this, uh, the value of n u should be close to the value of x. So then, what do we need to do next? Actually, we need to think of the integer part of this uh, n times u. So then, uh, in this way, you can see that this x is indeed the smallest integer greater than n u. Right? Between 
generate u, and I use n times u, and uh, actually this x is just the smallest integer greater than n u. But how to, how to express x using n u? And that's just uh, based on this uh, statement. And actually, uh, for that, maybe we need to uh, introduce a, a conception called integer floor. So what is an uh, integer floor? Integer floor is usually uh, written in this form. It's just uh, something like this. And this lowercase x is a arbitrary real number. Then the floor is defined as the largest integer that is less than or equal to x. So, so first, it, it, this floor, this integer floor is an integer. A second, it cannot be bigger than x. It's, a, it's okay if it's a less than x, if it's a equal to x. Okay, so maybe we can, we can see some example. So what is the floor of 1.2? According to this definition, it must be the largest integer less than or equal to 1.2, so which is 1, right? But sometimes it is also called the integer part of a, a real number. And uh, according to this, what is the floor of 5? Five? 5 itself is an integer, so itself is the, is the floor. And uh, what is the floor of 5.99? So even if 5.99 were close to 6, according to this definition, the floor of that is, uh, is still 5, which is the integer part, right? And uh, you need to be a bit careful about, about uh, <coughs> negative numbers. So, for example, let's think of the floor of minus um, 6.1. So sometimes you may think the floor of that is uh, minus 6, but actually according to this definition, because the floor cannot be bigger than that number, so the floor of that should be minus 7. Right? So you need to be careful about uh, negative values. So then uh, using the, this uh, notion of integer floor, actually you can see that this x is indeed the floor of n times u plus 1. Because uh, this x should be the smallest integer greater than n u. Right? Smallest, it must, so first, it must be greater than n u. And uh, so this floor of n u is the largest integer less than or equal to n u. Right? So if we wish to have the smallest smallest one greater than that, this should be the floor plus one. So this is the expression for, for, for x. So what we need to do to generate this uh, <coughs> discrete uniform variable? So first, we generate a standard uniform random number. And n times that, take the floor plus one. So <coughs> that is uh, uh, this example. Maybe we can check another example. So here, uh, x is a geometric random variable uh, given by so this uh, probability mass function. The probability that it takes k is equal to this, 1 minus p to the power k minus 1 times p, right? So this is just a standard uh, expression. And for our uh, convenience, we use this q for 1 minus p. So that looks like that. So why bother to, 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 to write in this way? Because uh, we will use this q uh, frequently in uh, next steps. So, that, so we, use, uh, we just uh, uh, use that for 1 minus p. Uh, so then, how to generate the value 
a value of x. Again, we need to follow this uh, discrete inverse uniform method. So to do that, first we need to find out the, the CDF of this uh, uh, geometric distribution, right? Um, what is that? So we know that for a uh, geometric uh, random variable, it may take value one, two, three, and so on, right? So what is a geometric random variable? You flip a coin, the number until you see the first has, the, the number of flips until the first has follows geometric distribution, right? So then, <coughs> what is this uh, CDF? The CDF should be the probability that it takes a value less than or equal to k, right? And then, uh, it would be more convenient for us to think of, uh, uh, to think of this probability as one minus probability that x is bigger than k. Why is so? Because the probability that x bigger than k means that the first k flips the whole tails, right? So what is the probability that the first k flips all tails? It's just a q to the power k. So q is the probability that you see tails. So here, <coughs> you see, uh, actually, it is a city f just follow this formula. And then, if we wish to use the discrete inverse transform method, so we just uh, follow this expression. Because uh, CDF looks like that, so if u takes a value between this value, 1 minus q to the power uh, k minus 1, and uh, 1 minus uh, q to the power k, so then this x should take a value k, right? <coughs> and also, uh, very similar to the previous example, we can further uh, simplify the expression a little bit uh, by using uh, integer form. So <coughs> how do we do that? So first, we know that um, so x should take value k if u is leading it. This interval, right? And uh, <coughs> then uh, we wish to simplify to this expression, to these two inequalities a little bit. How can we do that? So, so first uh, we see that uh, so there is a one, there is a one on both sides. So maybe we can we can take this one into the middle part. So from here we have this expression. So u minus 1 should be between so this number and this number. And x, so we know that u is a standard uniform between 0 and 1, right? So <coughs> then u minus 1 should be, a, should be negative. It could be more convenient for us to consider uh, positive numbers because next step we need to take logarithm. So then we just... Uh, we just uh, consider 1 minus u is instead. If we consider 1 minus u, so then on both sides, uh, we also need to take the uh, negative values, right? So as a result, uh, the direction of inequalities should be reversed or reversed. So from, from this step, we should try this step. 1 minus u should be between uh, q to the power of k minus 1 and q to the power of k. So this q, keep in mind, this q is equal to 1 minus p, right? So it is a number between 0 and 1. So because of this, so q to the power k minus 1 should be bigger than q to the power of k. So this is okay. Then next, we can take uh, logarithm. So on both sides. Uh, so then, from here, we can have here. So if we take logarithm for that part, so then we have a k times log q less than log 1 minus q, so less than that, right? And actually, uh, <coughs> maybe um, I need to let you know that when I write this uh, 
log, actually, in this, uh, in these, uh, the base is, uh, is unique. So sometimes, uh, in some books, it's also written as uh, a log, L N. But I prefer to use, uh, to use L O G. So why is so? Because, uh, <coughs> actually, it's, uh, it's more about conventions. If you check uh, mathematics uh, textbooks, I think they prefer to use this one, LOG. Because why, why, why so? Because uh, uh, you may know that uh, if the base is, uh, is, that, is that Oliver number, is E, then uh, the derivative of that is, uh, is the simplest. So <coughs> in mathematics uh, textbooks, if we use this one, if we talk about logarithm, by default, the base should be E. But so this uh, use LN is usually a convention in engineering textbooks. Because uh, in engineering, so it is very often that people use 10 as the base. So then when they use 10, they use, they use LG. So when they use uh, <coughs> E as the base, they use LN. So that, so this one looks very different from this LG. But in mathematics books, so people usually use LOG. So it's, uh, it's up to you. In, in, in the exam, you can use both this way or, or this way. But for me, I wish to keep it consistent. So in my notes, I use the LOG. But you need to understand be the same, right? <coughs> so then uh, we have this step. This, uh, when the logarithm of 1 minus u between this value and this value, we know that so this uh, x should take value k, right? So this one can be further simplified because uh, uh, so we see there is a, a log q on both sides. That's the common part. So from here, we can have this one. From this inequality, we can have these inequalities. But you need to be a bit careful because this q <coughs> is a number between 0 and 1. So which means that a log q is a negative. Because the log q is negative, <coughs> If both sides divided by log q, then we need to reverse the direction of uh, inequalities again. So that is, so from here, actually, we should have a. So then, you see, if this guy, log 1 minus u over log q between k minus 1 and k, x should take k, just like that. And according to our discussion uh, in the previous example, you can see that this x <coughs> can take this expression, right? We just uh, take the integer 4 of this one, 1 plus 1, because uh, that value should be equal to k, as long as so this one is between k minus 1 and k. So this is the expression. And actually, uh, <coughs> we can further uh, simplify that a little bit. Why is so? Because uh, if you observe this, 1 minus u, right? So what is u? u is a uh, standard uniform. Uniform between 0 and 1, right? And actually, uh, if you think about it, you may realize that 1 minus u is also a standard uniform, right? So u takes value between 0 and 1, so 1 minus u should also take value between 0 and 1. Over <coughs> any interval between 0 and 1, so the probability should be, the probability that u takes value within that should be proportional to the length of that interval. So 1 minus u should have the same property, right? So as a result, this 1 minus u should also be a standard uniform. If you, if this uh, 1 minus u is 
is also standing uniform, uh, whether call it U or minus U or, or what minus U, it does not really matter because they have the same distribution, right? In this way, you can see that we can we can use so this instead of this, just a log U over log Q. Take the four plus one. So this guy must have the same distribution as this one. Right? And uh, you may ask me what well, I better to do is because uh, if you use this <coughs> expression, actually, you don't, you don't have to do so this minus operation. So it's more efficient. Right? So <coughs> this is the this is how to how to generate a geometry and run a variable. Just uh, <coughs> just this expression. So then, uh, so far, we know how to generate uh, an arbitrary discrete run variable using standard uniform, right? So then, of course, the next question is uh, if we need to generate continuous run variable, how to do that, right? And actually, uh, the idea is, uh, is the same. So as I, uh, we, we also, we also use uh, the inverse transform method. But here, we just use the continuous version. But the idea will be the same as what we did for here. Discrete run variables. So, actually, uh, I think uh, when we talk about this uh, uh, continuous version of this inverse transform method, uh, you will see the idea. You will you will see the idea uh, would be it could be easier for us to understand this method when we generate uh, continuous run variables. Uh, <coughs> I think the, the the basic idea is just to follow this proposition. So this is the foundation of uh, the inverse transform method. So let's uh, let's check this one, this proposition. So <coughs> if this U, capital U, is a standard uniform random number, and uh, we wish to generate uh, a continuous random variable. So whose uh, CDF is this uh, capital F? So which means that this capital F is known. We wish to generate something. So whose distribution follows this uh, capital F? Now how do we do that? Uh, <coughs> this proposition tells us that the inverse function of F of U actually has distribution capital F. So here, to better understand that, maybe um, let's check that. So let's check the things one by one. So first, we need to understand what is this uh, inverse function. So we have a function, so this capital F, so, uh, which is the CDF of something, right? Then what is the inverse function? So we know that this F is the CDF. Then, so what is the function? Roughly speaking, function, you can understand function just as a, as a black box. It has an input, it has an output, right? If uh, the input is the same, the output should always be the same, right? If the input is A, the output is B. Then, so if, uh, as long as you input A, it will always produce B, then it can be understood as a function, right? So if we think of this uh, black box, this function, if uh, we change the direction of uh, input and output, if this time the input is B, the output is always A, then such a function is called the inverse function of the previous of the original function, right? So, 
original function is that input is A, we produce B. The inverse one is that input is B, we produce A. So that is the inverse function. So, so in this sense, how to understand the inverse function of uh, the CD app? Actually, uh, it means that if you input Z, the output is U, for the inverse function, you input U, the output should be equal to this Z. So what is, what is that Z? So this Z should satisfy f of Z is equal to U. Right? So this is the inverse function. So, <coughs> so then you see how to generate this uh, continuous random variable x. So first, you need to have uh, a standard uniform. And you, use, uh, you put this standard uniform into that inverse function of uh, capital F, the CDF. Then the output will be another, will be a number. Because uh, this u is a random variable, actually, f the inverse of u should be a random variable. And this proposition says that that output random variable should have CDF uh, capital F. So, uh, actually, uh, it, is, uh, it is not difficult to prove that. Let me just uh, go over the proof of this result so that you can have a, a better understanding of this result. So this is something we wish to show. So u, again, u is standard uniform. F inverse of u should have a CDF f. How to show that? And actually, so first we need to <coughs> we need to check this. So so this is the expression of x, right? To show that this guy has the CDF f. Essentially, we need to show this. The probability that x takes a value less than or equal to any lowercase f, x should be equal to f of x. But we need to be clear at this moment. We, we wish to show x given by this expression has the CDF capital F. So which means that at this step, we cannot assume this x has CDF like this, capital F. This is something we wish to show, right? So you need to be clear because sometimes uh, you could be confused. At this time, we don't know the CDF of this uh, capital X. So this is something we wish to show. So then how to, how to show that? So first, we need to use a, a property of, uh, of, uh, of the, uh, the property of an arbitrary CDF. Because this F is a, is a given CDF. We don't know whether it's the CDF of, of the such X, right? But for an arbitrary CDF, the first thing that we know that it must be an increasing function. So what does increasing function mean? Increasing function mean the meaning of that, roughly speaking, it means that if, if we observe the curve of that function, so it will be always uh, increasing. So it will be, it take, the value it takes it will be bigger and bigger. So that's a, so just like what we, what we, what we uh, wrote, in the previous lecture, actually, we know that the CDF. So it could be like a step function if it's getting bigger and bigger, right? But here, so increasing function means that for any a less than b, f of a should be less than or equal to f of b. So, so this is a definition for increasing function. Why any 
CDF must be increasing function because uh, uh, maybe I should not use that C because uh, Because uh, maybe I use Y for an arbitrary kind of verbal. So we just uh, so this Y <coughs> because of this uh, F is a uh, is a CDF. So suppose that this uh, run verbal Y has CDF. So then, let's think of this event. So y takes value less than or equal to a. If this a is a number less than or equal to b, we can see that this event must be a sub subset of this event. If y takes any value less than or equal to a, because a is less than b, so then y, the, the value y takes must also be less than or equal to b, right? So, if, which means that if this happens, this must happen. So, so the outcome in this set must be also outcomes in this set. So, this one must be a subset of this one. If this one is a subset of this one, so which means that this f of a, by this definition, it should be the probability that y takes value less than a, so it must be less than or equal to the probability y takes the value less than or equal to b, which is f of b, right? So here, I just wish to argue that this CDF must be an increasing function. As long as a is less than b, f of a must be less than or equal to f of b. So this is the property to use next. So now, let's show that. So actually, for this capital X, we find we find according to this expression, its CDF must also be this capital F. So how to show that? So as a as I explained. So we need to prove this, right? So then let's consider the right-hand side, which is the probability that x takes a value less than or equal to this lowercase x. So x less than or equal to this lowercase x, because uh, this f, capital F, is increasing function. So which means that this uh, f of x must less than or equal to this f of uh, lowercase x. We must have this. So from here, we must have here. Now, what is this uh, capital X? We know that this capital X is defined as at the inverse of the U. So this U is a standard uniform, right? So we have this, uh, this probability. Then let's think of uh, what is uh, this guy? f of f inverse of u. What is that? So maybe uh, it's better to write it in this way. So we know that if f of z is equal to u, then according to the definition of the inverse function, then z should be equal to f inverse of u. Right? So we just change the direction of the input output. So then uh, <coughs> let's think of uh, what is uh, f of uh, f inverse of u. So maybe it's, uh, we can write in this way, f inverse of u, maybe we just uh, call it z, right? And according to the definition of uh, inverse function, we know that f of z should be equal to u. So work, you can, you can think in this way. 
So the input is like this. Output is here. So first, you you whatever you put in the 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 input of the inverse function is u, right? You put u inside of the inverse function. It produces something. Then the output of the inverse function will be will be put back to the original function. So which means that you first put put u in this way, and then you just uh, push it back. And in the original function, u will also be pushed back. Right. So that's that's a, that's the intuitive ex explanation of that. So from here, actually, you can see that so this guy must be equal to this u. What is this u? This u is just a standard uniform. So standard uniform <coughs> probability that standard uniform takes a value less than or equal to this uh, capital F of lowercase of x. So this lowercase of uh, f of x is CDF. CDF is just a probability. A probability must be between 0 and 1, right? So this f of x is a number between 0 and 1, and this u is standard uniform. So how to evaluate this probability? We know that standard uniform has a density 1 between 0 and 1, right? So then this probability just uh, follow this uh, integral. The density, the integral from 0 up to f of x. Because f of x must be less than or equal to 1, so then it should be equal to this. What is the, what is the value of this expression? It is simply equal to f of x minus 0, which is f of x. Right? So then you see, <coughs> so far we just, uh, we just proved uh, so this result. This f inverse of standard uniform must have CDF. So so actually this uh, uh, the proof is also here. So using this idea, let's let's check how to uh, how to generate uh, exponential random rule. So in this example, uh, this uh, kept X is uh, exponential random variable with rate 1. So what is the rate? Rate is just the parameter lambda. So then, actually, if you if you check the previous slide, the CDF of uh, exponential random variable should be 1 minus e to the power minus lambda x, right? But here, because uh, lambda is equal to 1, so the CDF should take this form. F of x is, is equal to 1 minus e to the power of minus x. So here, x should be on the negative. Uh, so this is the inverse transform method. So this is the CDF. The first thing we need to do is to find out the inverse function of this capital F. How do you do that? So, so first we wish to find out the inverse function of that. How to do that? Maybe we can write this uh, 1 minus e to the power minus x, write it as u. So then, here we express u in terms of x, right? So then, let's see how to express x in terms of u. Then we we'll find out the form of the inverse function. So from here, you can see this e to the power of minus x is equal to one minus u, right? If we take 
a logarithm of both sides, what we have is this one minus x is equal to log 1 minus u. And then x is equal to minus log 1 minus u. So this is the, so, so this, this part is the inverse function, right? So the inverse function of u is uh, minus log 1 minus u. Because of this, how to generate uh, exponential random variable? We just need to, inverse function looks like that. We just plug in the inverse function with a standard unit form, right? So if this capital U is a standard unit form random variable, so then x given by that, the inverse function of CDF should follow exponential distribution with rate 1, right? And again, as we argued in the previous example, this 1 minus u should also follow standard uniform distribution, right? So then whether you use u or minus 1 minus u, it does not matter. It should be the same. and have the same distribution. Then for efficiency, computational efficiency, we don't have to do this uh, minus operation. We don't have, we don't bother to do that. We can just use uh, u instead of this 1 minus u. Then this guy should also have uh, <coughs> exponential distribution with rate 1. So this is how to generate exponential random variable. And uh, <coughs> so, so you see, uh, for continuous, uh, for continuous random variables, uh, this inverse transform method could be <coughs> even more simple than the discrete version. So there's a <coughs> another another method uh, <coughs> for generating uh, an arbitrary random variable. So previously, so we can see that in principle, so this a uh, inverse transform method. So it's just this very simple method can generate an arbitrary continuous random variable, right? But in practice, uh, it may not be always useful. So why is so? Maybe let's think of uh, a problem like this. So if you can generate a lot of uh, standard uniforms, like, like we did uh, in the past, how to generate a standard, uniform, uh, standard normal random variable? So this time, normal distribution, standard normal. Of course, you can, you can follow this. You can use that. But keep in mind, <coughs> so this, uh, the CDF of, of a normal distribution does not have a closed form, right? So we know the PDF of that. So it is that bell shape PDF. It follows exponential function. However, if we wish to take the integral, if we wish to know the CDF of that, no closed form expression. So if this uh, capital F does not have a closed form expression, how to find out the inverse function of that? So it could be even more difficult, right? So <coughs> of course you may you may find out some numerical ways to approximate to approximately to arbitrarily approximately so calculate the the inverse function of that. However, it may not be computationally efficient, right? So then, how to how to generate <coughs> the standard normal random variable? So most often we need to use another method, which is called rejection method. So why we need to use this uh, 
rejection method instead of the inverse transform method, as I explained. So sometimes, so the CDF may not have a closed form expression. So in this way, I will, if we wish to use the inverse transform method, then it could be very complicated. So computationally, it may not be efficient. So in this way, <coughs> so we use a, we often use another method. So the rejection, the idea of a rejection method is like this. A very, very rough idea like this. So suppose that we wish to generate a random variable x with density with this lowercase n. So you just think of a standard normal, okay? So we know the expression of the density, but the CDF could be complicated. And uh, <coughs> in this case, as I said, it may not be easy to use a uh, uh, inverse transform, but it is possible to generate another random variable y. So this y has a different PDF as f. So it has a PDF, this lowercase p, which is different from f. So this, uh, this lowercase f is the PDF so of the random variable we wish to generate. So, but as I said, it's complicated. However, it is uh, possible to generate a random variable y. So, whose density g is kind of similar to this f, but not exactly the same. So, we have two densities. So, this density, this PDF g and this PDF f. This lowercase f is the PDF, this random variable we, we wish to generate. So this G is the PDF of the random variable that is easy to generate. So then the idea of the rejection method is like this. So because uh, this random variable Y is easy to generate, so each time, we first to generate a value for y. And then we design a mechanism. Sometimes, so we just let this x take the value of y. We generate the value of y. Sometimes we let x take the value of y. But sometimes we don't let x to take the value of y. So in this way, if we don't take it, the value of y, it means that we rejected that value. We do it again. So in this way, so you can see that this x, although the value is generated according to the PDF g, because sometimes x accept that value, sometimes it will reject that value. So the distribution of x will be different from the distribution, this lowercase g, right? But as long as we can reject the values in a smart way, then we can make the distribution of x so to follow the desi of this desired density for lowercase f. So which means that by this rejection, essentially we modify the, the values we accept. Originally, it has the PDF G, but by rejection, we just modify this uh, PDF a little bit to make it follow lowercase f. So that's the idea. But how to do that? <coughs> it turns out that it could be very simple. So, <coughs> so first, it should satisfy a condition like this. G is something easy to generate, right? 
and then so we need to find out a constant C, a number C. So this C is a number that for all real number Y, f of Y divided by g of Y should be less than or equal to C. So in other words, this C is the upper bound. So it's the upper bound of f over g. f is a function. g is a function. So f over g will be a function, right? So this C is a upper bound of that function. As long as f and g follows, so this condition, satisfy this condition, then we can use this rejection idea to generate the value of x. So what is the exact procedure of this uh, rejection method? It looks like that. So, so first, by using the inverse transform method, we generate the value of y. So this y has density g, right? Again, so this g is something easy to generate, but this is not something we wish to have. And next, we need to generate a standard uniform, another standard uniform, mu. So in the third step, we check the value of u. We check whether it is uh, less than or equal to f of y over c times g of y. So here, what is this c? This c is a number such that for any f of locus y over g of y, so it is c is bigger than this, this thing, f over g, right? So from here, you can see that f of y must be less than or equal to c times g of y, right? So as a result, so this thing, this thing on the right-hand side, so this guy must be a number less than or equal to y, right? So then we just check. This u is a standard uniform. We just check if u is less than or equal to this, this value. If it is less than that, we let x takes the value of y. Otherwise, we reject that and do this the whole procedure again. So if it's rejected, then we go back to step one. Then we, 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 we generate another value for y. And we generate another value, another standard uniform, and check this. Right? So you see, from this procedure, so this x must to take a value from y, but may not be immediately. We may have to repeat several times until x takes a value of y. So in this way, the distribution of x will not be the same as y. As I said, so this procedure will help you to modify the distribution. Originally, the distribution has a PDF G, lowercase g, and it looked like whatever shape. But by this rejection procedure, that distribution will be changed. And according to this, so eventually, so that distribution of X will follow this lowercase x. So you can prove that. So this is uh, uh, stated in this proposition. So by this rejection method, then uh, the run variable uh, generated will follow uh, the PDF, this low case f. So that's the idea of rejection method. So maybe let's check uh, how to how to generate the, the standard normal run variable. So according to this. Uh, uh, Rejection method. So again, why we need to use this rejection method for standard normal? Because uh, it's CDF. The, CD, the normal CDF does not have closed form expression. It is uh, it is not easy to 
the finality of the inverse function of that, right? But we know that the normal distribution, uh, we know the expression for the PDF of normal, right? So that is the bell-shaped exponential distribution. And uh, it is great that so it has a, this expression, right? And we also know that how to generate exponential analog. We did that in the previous example, right? So for this uh, exponential random variable, so it's a, it's a, it's a density, of course, not the same as uh, this uh, standard normal, but it is also an exponential function, right? Kind of similar. So in this way, and, and we can also show that, so there exists a, a constant C, so such that F over G is bounded by C. So then, according to this uh, rejection method, what do we need to do is just like this. So first, we generate exponential random variable. So which is uh, the random variable y here. And then generate a standard uniform. And uh, so we check whether this standard uniform less than, so a given value, less than that value. If it is less than that, then, so this uh, x takes the value from exponential random variable. Otherwise, do it again. So of course, in this example, there are other things to consider. Because, uh, <coughs> because actually standard uniform the variable may take the positive values, may take negative values. But exponential random variable can only take positive values, right? So here, in this way, so this, uh, this issue is, uh, is, is, is easier to fix. We may first generate the absolute value of standard normal, and then arbitrarily let to be positive or negative to the next step. So I think this is the rough idea how to generate the standard normal and verbal. Uh, the whole procedure is here. I think uh, I just leave it to you. Uh, after class, so please read that. So, uh, but the, the idea, just just as uh, what I described just now. So, so essentially, that's uh, that's everything for the. For the simulation part. So uh, <coughs> maybe we can we can start uh, another topic, which is uh, uh, Marco Chase. So what is a Markov chain? Uh, to explain Markov chain, maybe let's first consider an example like this. So this example, I think I will use uh, this example in uh, at least the next two lectures. So this is not a simple example. Uh, the question is like this. So we know that uh, in many OS, there's a, a bookstore uh, in Trina Library, right? It's called NLS Co-op. So I think if you, maybe you bought your textbook there. Uh, so this uh, AOS co-op actually it sells uh, laptop computers. Maybe we just uh, put up uh, a toy example using so this bookstore. So suppose that the weekly demand of uh, a specific model of a laptop computer follows a uh, distribution like that. So the demand of that com uh, computer could be from zero up to four. So with probability 0.3, so demand is zero. 0.3 it'll be one, and so on. So it could be at least zero and most of four. So then uh, 
we use this capital DN for the demand of uh, weak M. D for demand. So suppose that this, uh, this door has a, has a policy like this. At the end of each week, if the inventory, inventory means the remaining number of laptops, if the inventory at the time were equal to one, so the store would order more uh, computers to bring the inventory back to four. And at the end of uh, Friday, I check the number of uh, uh, computers. If it's less than or equal to one, then I, I call somebody. So then by the weekend, they will send more to me so that on Monday, I will have four. So at the end of week, less than or equal to one, at the beginning of next week, it will be four. So that's the policy. If uh, by the end of uh, so this week, I will have more than one, then I don't, I don't have to order, right? So then the left over will be the inventory level at the beginning of next, next week. So this is a, <coughs> a very simple policy. So that, let's uh, assume that uh, all unmet demand, all unmet demand, will be lost. What does it mean? So, suppose that at the beginning of this week, I have two computers, but the demand of this week is four, right? Demand is four, I have two, which means that I can only sell two. The other, the demand of another two will be lost. It cannot be satisfied. So that's, a, that's the assumption. So that's the meaning of uh, unmet demand will be lost. Uh, we use XN for the inventory level at the beginning of each week, XN. So suppose that at the beginning of zero week, I have four at hand. I wish to know that what is the expected value of XN. What is X10? X10 is the inventory level or the number of computers at the beginning of the 10th week, right? Now I have four. I wish to predict on average in 10 weeks. So how many I will have? So that is this uh, example. <coughs> so, um, this example, uh, the siding, I think is a pretty simple, but uh, if you think about it a bit more, you may realize that it's not easy, right? So I wish to know <coughs> something in 10 weeks. At the beginning of the 10th week, the inventory level will depend on the demand in the 9th week, right? And also depend on the inventory level at the beginning of the ninth week. And the ninth for the ninth week, it would depend on the demand of the eighth week, inventory level of the eighth week, and so on, right? So in this way, actually, you can see that if I wish to know something happened in tenth week, I need to calculate what will happen from week zero to week one to week two to week three. So, all, so what will happen in all those 10th week will determine the distribution of X10, right? So, in this sense, it does not seem simple. So, and actually, maybe I can uh, talk a little bit more about this, uh, this type of uh, uh, problems. So this problem is a, is a very, very simple uh, example of the so-called inventory problems. Inventory problems usually uh, care about 
a large uh, national team at your hand, right? How did you determine the inventory level? So for inventory problems, usually uh, the inventory cannot be too low or too high. So why it cannot be too low? So in this example, you can see that if my inventory of each week is too low, then there will be a lot of unmet demands, right? Say if each week I can, I only keep one computer if the demand is uh, two, three, four, then I don't have sufficient stuff to sell, right? So then uh, my revenue cannot be good. So inventory cannot be too low. But you may think that, so that's why my white, white, white bother, we can keep a lot of uh, computers at hand so that each week um, I can, as long as they're demand, I can sell, right? But this problem, of course, we can do that. But, but, but in general, the, a very high inventory level could also be, could also be an issue. So maybe let me, uh, <coughs> maybe let's, let's think of an example like this. So suppose you are a car dealer, right? You sell cars. Uh, then so there is a customer coming to see you. Maybe he or she tells you that, hello, I wish to uh, check your car, check your cars. I wish to buy this model with uh, whatever color, say red color, right? Uh, I wish my car to have uh, leather seats, to have uh, uh, sunroof, to have uh, a super fancy audio system or whatever. So you know that for cars, there could be a lot of uh, options. So maybe <coughs> this, call, this class customer can ask you, uh, can I have it tomorrow? Right? So you see that as a car dealer to meet your customers' demands. So because uh, the demands could be so diverse, <coughs> different models, different colors, different options, if you wish to meet uh, all demands, you need to have a very, very high inventory level. Right? You need to, usually for, <coughs> for big car dealers, they need to maintain inventory level of uh, at least hundreds of cars at hand in inventory. So hundreds of cars, uh, which means that they need to have uh, a big warehouse or a big garage, right? And uh, so you need to have people to manage them, to do some maintenance, and more importantly, to keep so such a high inventory level, you need money, right? So where's the money from? So it's very likely that so it's, uh, you borrow money from the bank, which means that this is not your own money. It's not free. As long as you keep a large inventory level, you need to pay interest. So nothing is free. So from this example, you can see that at least for car dealers, they need to carefully think about it. So if uh, the inventory level is too high, then the cost could be significant. It cannot be too high, right? Maybe another example is like, uh, say, you're the manager of a department store. You sell clothes, right? So in, in Singapore, it's okay because uh, so it's, uh, it's always summer, summer forever. But in most countries, you know, they have seasons, right? So at the end of the summer, if you still have a, a lot of t-shirts, skirts, stuff like that at hand, then so whether you need to sell them at a much cheaper price or you need to keep them for the next year, right? So. If you have a, a very high inventory level for the current season, then you cannot sell all of them. So which means that for the next season, you may not 
you may not have sufficient cash. So for next season, it's more difficult for you to manage your orders, right? So that's a that's also that's also a problem. So you can see that for inventory problem for inventory problems, usually the inventory cannot be too high, cannot be too low. And the question is how to manage the inventory to make sure that your costs can be minimized and your rate revenue can be maximized. So that's a I think that that that's the the, the so uh, the stuff the inventory manager need to care about. And as I said, this is just a very simple example. This is not really uh, optimization problem, but uh, from this uh, uh, example, I think you can see that there must be some trade-off uh, how to manage your inventory. So, uh, as I explained, actually, in this example, we wish to find out the expected value of X10 and uh, to, to know the distribution of X10 uh, Essentially, we need to study, uh, we need to know distribution of uh, X9, X8, X7, and so on, right? So then, uh, essentially, from here, you can see that we need to, what we need to study is just not, although here, so the question is about one random variable, which is X10, right? But to analyze that random variable, we need to study a sequence of random variables. We need to know x1, x2, x3, up to x10. That's a sequence of stuff. Sequence of random variables indexed by time. So a collection of random variables indexed by time is usually referred to as a stochastic process. So this is the definition of a stochastic process. What is that? It's a collection of random variables indexed by time. So time, time as the index. Of course, uh, here, so there are two cases. We talk about time, it could be discrete time. Discrete time in this example is a discrete time, so which means uh, week zero, week one, week two, and so on. So the time actually is just uh, the sequence. The, the, the time is just uh, represented by uh, a set of non-negative integers, right? So accordingly, if this collection of random variables if this stochastic process consists of countably many random variables, then it's called a discrete time stochastic process. So in this example, it's discrete time. If the stochastic process consists of uncountably many random variables, so it is called continuous time uh, stochastic process. So uh, maybe you can think of an <coughs> example like this. So if we can use uh, this yi for the highest uh, stock price of IBM on day i. So the zeroth day, the first day, and so on, right? So suppose so these are days in the future. So which means that I don't know uh, the I don't know the, the 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 highest stock price in the future. They become random variables for me, right? Because each day, for each day, I only need to know one price. So this collection of random variables would be a discrete time stochastic process. But if we think of the IBM stock price, and actually so the price can change at any time, continuous time, right? If I just use this lowercase t for the index of time, so Actually, at any specific second, it will have a price. It will change continuously. So in this way, so this y of t, 
So this T is just continuous time because uh, we have uncountably many such Ts. So this is, uh, as a result, this Y of T is a continuous time stochastic process. Uh, here, I think in, the, in this lecture, uh, in this course, uh, we will only consider discrete time uh, stochastic process. So actually, it is just a sequence of uh, random variables. Uh, I think we can have a break for 10 minutes. Okay, uh, <coughs> so let's, uh, uh, let's continue. Uh, so stochastic process is just uh, a collection of random variables indexed by time. And uh, so the, the next notion is the space base of the stochastic process. What is the state space? The first that we know that for a stochastic process, it is just a collection of random variables. The state, uh, the state space is just the set of all possible values that these random variables may take. All possible values. So then, uh, to to better understand this uh, this notion, maybe. So let's think of the state space uh, in our uh, example. So again, so this state space just uh, all possible values. So if we collect all the random variables in a stochastic process, the values so these random variables may take must be within this state space. So in our example, <coughs> so we know that at the beginning we have four computers, right? To know uh, state space, because x0 is equal to 4, which means that this 4 must be within the state space, right? And then, so let's check what other values uh, so this uh, stochastic process may take. Let's consider one by one. <coughs> so we know that if the the demand of uh, with zero would be D zero, right? So, so the demand follows this expression. It's, it could be zero up to four. So then <coughs> the left over would be four minus D zero. And then what will be the value of what would be the unit level at the beginning of next week? So, <coughs> so for the beginning, uh, for the unit level of the beginning of the week, we need to consider the ordering policy. So recall that the ordering policy is like this. If the left over is uh, 0 or 1, we need to bring it up to 4. Otherwise, we don't order, right? So which means that if the demand of week zero is uh, zero, one, or two, then the left over will be bigger than one. In this case, we don't order. If we don't order at the beginning of next week, we will just have four minus D zero, which is the left over, right? And otherwise, if uh, the demand is bigger or equal to three, so we need to order and bring the image level up to four. So in this way, if you check that, you can see that the x1 can take value two, three, or four, right? And the uh, uh, two, three, or four, and because uh, of the ordering policy, at the beginning of a week, we cannot have uh, computers less than or equal to one, right? And uh, we cannot have more than four, right? So in this way, actually, it is easy to argue that not just uh, x1, where 
all weeks in the future. So the possible value we can have would just be 2, 3, or 4. In this way, you can see that for this problem, the space space has only three numbers. Just a 2, 3, and 4. So this is the space space of uh, this example. So then uh, recall that uh, what we need to study is the expected, expected uh, value of x10, right? And uh, as I said, to, to know the distribution of x10, uh, we need to analyze week by week. So then uh, let's see, what will be the, what will be the, dynamic equation uh, week by week. So, so this stochastic process actually follows so, so such a equation. So this Xn <coughs> is the initial image level of the nth week, right? If we wish to know the image level of next week, actually, just uh, similar to this, we need to know the <coughs> initial level of this week and the demand of this week, right? Then, so which is uh, the left over would be xn minus dn. If this thing is bigger or equal to 2, then we don't order. So at the beginning of next week, so this is the level. If xn minus dn is less than or equal to 1, so it is possible that this is even active, right? So then we will have a, a net demand. If this is uh, less than or equal to 1, we need to order. So at the beginning of next week, so the, the initial level will be like this. So you see that <coughs> week by week, the dynamics would be pretty simple. We just uh, check this uh, expression, right? Just follow this expression. However, as I, as I explained, so the tricky part is that if we wish to know the distribution of x10, according to this, so we need to know the distribution of x9 and d9, right? And uh, x9 also depends on x8 and d8 and so on, right? And uh, even if this expression <coughs> is simple, but because uh, so the system is evolving week by week, if we wish to know X10, actually all the entire history, the dynamics of each week will be involved, right? So, <coughs> but at least, so you see that from this example, if we wish to study the <coughs> behavior or certain metrics of uh, stochastic process. Generally speaking, it may depend on the space at any previous time, or it may depend on the entire history. From time zero up to now, everything could affect the distribution of my current state, right? So this is, a <coughs> this is the difficulty of uh, uh, studying stochastic process. Uh, but if we wish to trace all the history, then, of course, uh, the problem may not be easy. So, so let's check this, so this, uh, this, uh, this equation. So whether we can have some, some simpler ways to think of that. <coughs> so as I explained, if we wish to, if we wish to know X10, it depends on all the history. Anything happened in the past may affect the distribution of X10, right? But as I said, this, this equation is not difficult, it's not complex. You can see that if this Xn is known, so for example, you know that this Xn is equal to 3, 
it is it is not random. The post value know that it's accidentally asynchronous to its source. Now you can see that the distribution of x sub n plus 1 of this guy only depends on the distribution of the demand of that week. Right? You know the distribution of dn because uh, the value of that is fixed, and then you can determine the distribution of x sub n plus 1. So this one is not that difficult. And uh, from this very simple observation, you can see that if you know the value of xn, how did you reach that value will not affect the distribution of the image level of the next week. Right? Again, if the value of xn is known, it's fixed. For example, you know that it is equal to 3. How did you reach this image level? What happened in the past to make the current image level to be 3 will not affect the distribution of the image level of next week. Right? Because it only depends on the distribution and uh, <coughs> the image level of this week. So this is an observation. Why I said, so this observation is important, because uh, generally speaking, if we wish to study the distribution of X10, as I said, as I explained, so it depends on the entire history, right? But this observation allows us to study that just week by week. From week zero, maybe we can first study what will happen at the beginning of week one. What is the distribution of x1? Then <coughs> from x1, according to this equation, if x1 is fixed, what is your initial value at x0? Actually, it won't affect the distribution of x2. Right? And then from that, we can move to x2, the second week. And if we know the value of x2, how did we reach that value? It will not matter to x3. Right? In this way, you see that for this example, what we really need to do is to just move week by week. But for each week, we must be very sure about the distribution of in image level at the beginning of this week. From this week, if we know, we can fix that image level, if we know the distribution of that, what happened in the past will not affect what will happen in the future. So in this way, our strategy is just to do week by week, from x0 to x1. At x1, we study the distribution, the distribution of the initial level of this week. Forget about the history. We predict x2. At x2, we forget about x1. We don't care about this. Just week by week. We don't track the entire history. But of course, we can do this because, because of this dynamical equation allows us to do this, right? Because this dynamical equation only involves x, n, and d, n. It does not involve the history. There are no variables before that in the past, right? <coughs> so this is the nice part. Actually, uh, so let me summarize so this uh, observation because it is important. So once the value of xn is known, the distribution of the maximum variable no longer depends on so what happened in the past, xn minus 1, xn minus 2, and so on, right? And actually, so this is, means that it's, uh, this is the so-called conditional independence. So condition on the current value. 
what will happen in the future and what happened in the past become independent. Independent means they have nothing to do with each other, right? So in other words, so this is uh, something like this, as long as I know my current inventory level, how did I reach that inventory level will not affect the inventory level in the future. So that's, a, that's the most important part of this problem, right? And actually, for a stochastic process, that has a, such a property. It is called a Markov chain. So the, <coughs> the reverse definition of Markov chain is, uh, is here. So a sequence of random variables, maybe we call them x0, x1, and so on, so, and suppose this uh, capital S is the state space. So, let's recall what is the state space. State space is the set of all possible values, random variables in this stochastic process can take. Right? So, all possible values. As I explained, in our example, the state space has only three numbers, two, three, and four, right? And uh, <coughs> so this sequence of random variables with such a state space is called discrete time Markov chain if they satisfy so this condition. So let's, uh, let's check this, let's study this condition. So this condition, you see, is about conditional Probabilities. On the left hand side, it is a conditional probability. On the right hand side, it is also a conditional probability. So let me be, uh, let's uh, examine those two conditional probabilities uh, more closely. On the, the right hand side, what is that? So it is the probability that x n plus 1 takes value j, given x0 takes whatever value x1 takes whatever value up to xn takes whatever value, right? <coughs> so each value is just a value within the state space. So how do I understand this? So maybe it's more convenient for us to think of uh, the current time, the present time, is n. So now it's, it's time n. If, it's a <coughs> if uh, the current time is n, then x sub n plus 1 would be the next state, next step, right? Current step is n, the next step. So this is the life and step. Essentially, it's just a, we wish to know the distribution of the next step given the entire history up to now. Again, the current time is n. So x n plus 1 will be the next step. We wish to know the distribution of the next step. And we know the entire history. We know what happened at x0, x1, up to now. Using this, this set of information, we wish to predict the distribution of the next step. That is right-hand side. What is the right-hand side? The right-hand side seems much simpler. It is still we wish to predict what will happen next step. But I only know what I am now. I know my current state. I wish to know what will happen next step. So <coughs> for a stochastic process to be a Markov chain, we require that. So those two conditional probabilities be equal. But what does it mean? It means that if you know the current state, whether you know what happened in the past or not, it does not matter to you to predict what will happen next. Right? So this is exactly as I explained here. So the meaning of uh, Markov chain is just like so this stochastic process should have such a property. What property? So as long as you know my current state, 
what happened in the past has nothing to do with what will happen in the future. They become conditionally independent. So that's the meaning of uh, uh, mark of chain. So <coughs> why it is so important? Because uh, as I explained, if this process is a mark of chain, then we can analyze them step by step. From time zero, we try to predict the distribution at time one, right? We move one step in time. Then, based on the distribution of uh, at time one, we predict what will happen for time two. So, then from time two, we predict time three. Because it is a mark of chain, at time two, what happened in time one and time zero, it does not matter. It won't affect the distribution at time three, right? So, because of this, each time we just need to know our current state, current distribution, and use that to predict what will happen next. Then forget about the history. We only need to know what is happening now, my current state, and do the next. From this way, we just push step by step to understand the process. So, <coughs> the Markov property, so this one, make this possible. And uh, <coughs> how can we tell if uh, a discrete time stochastic process is a Markov chain? And actually, uh, most of the time, uh, as long as so this process can be expressed in such a way, it can be very easy to tell it is a Markov chain. So the state, the, the state of the next step can be expressed as a function of the current state and another random variable, which is independent of current state. As long as uh, we can do something like this, then we can tell that this process must be a Markov chain. So from this expression, you can definitely see that. So the state of the next step only depends on the current step. As long as we know this, we know the value of this, then the other thing is you only need to know the distribution of another random variable. If this is fixed, how did you reach this part? It's, uh, it's not important, right? So then this is, a <coughs> again, if, uh, if uh, so the process can be expressed in this way, then this, uh, this process X must be a Markov chain. Just, uh, you can see that this expression is just a generalized version of this one. Okay? <coughs> X sub n plus 1 depends on Xn as something independent of the uh, sequential process. <coughs> so this is a, a discrete time Markov chain. And another notion is called time homogeneous Markov chain. So what does this uh, uh, time homogeneous mean? So roughly speaking, that uh, the time homogeneous means the transition behavior must not change with time. So what do you mean transition? Transition just because this is a Markov chain, and uh, so the run variables takes values in the state space. State space is a set of all possible values those random variables may take, right? So state space, transition probability essentially just means that at this step, I take this value, next step, I will take another value, right? Because it's the passive process. It will change value constantly. So that, from this value to that value, we will have, uh, we will make such a transition with certain probability. Then, so such a probability is called transition probability. If the transition probability does not change with time, then the discrete time, uh, the Markov chain is called time homogeneous. So the definition is like this. <coughs> For any states, I and J. So 
So again, space means the possible values so those run variables may take. So here the condition is like this. If at time n the condition I make the condition probability from i to j at time n does not depend on n. It's always equal. So then this Markov chain is called time homogeneous Markov chain. Right? So this n could be any n, but it's a, it does not depend on n. So we may, because it does not depend on n, we may just take it as a zero. From the probability we make transition from i to j is always the same with respect to time. Then it is called the time homogeneous Markov chain. Because uh, for a uh, time homogeneous Markov chain, so the transition probability from i to j by one step does not change with time. Then for our convenience, we simply use this a piece of ij for this transition probability. So from i to j, right? So this is a transition probability <coughs> from state i to state j. So now let's check this uh, question. So in this uh, laptop example, is this a Markov chain? Of, of course, as I just explained. Is it time homogeneous? So yes, because uh, why it is time homogeneous? Because uh, you see that in this week, I have uh, I at hand. What will be the probability that next week I have J? From I to J, so this transition probability in this example only depends on the distribution of the demand. Right? The demand in this example will be the same. The distribution of the demand will be the same for all weeks. Right? Demand or IID. IID means independent, identically distributed. So because of, because of uh, identically distri uh, distributed demands, so this uh, transition probability uh, will be the same from week to week. It's a uh, time homogeneous. And actually, uh, in, in this course, uh, we only discuss time homogeneous Markov chains. So uh, this is the transition probability. So maybe Max, let's uh, send out the transition probabilities uh, in, in our example. So this one actually it's uh, I think it's a pretty simple. So you, you need to you need to closely follow me because uh, this one uh, will be a building block of our next steps. So we know that this is the this is the distribution of uh, weekly demand, right? So the demand of each week could be zero up to four computers and following this distribution. And we wish to know transition probabilities of this Markov chain. So when we talk about transition probabilities, which means that what is the probability that I make transition from state i to state j, right? So to study this, we must be very sure about the state space. So as I explained, state space is just a two, three, four, right? What does it mean? At the beginning of each week, you can have either two computers, three computers, or four computers at hand. So that's the meaning of state space in this example. It can only take those three values. Because of this, you can make only you can only make transitions between those three states, right? Three states to three states. 
you have totally nine transition probabilities, right? <coughs> so let's check them. What is the probability that we make transition from state two to state two? State two to state two, according to the definition, means that, so this week I have, at the beginning of this week, I have two. And at the beginning of next week, I will have two. So how can this happen? From two to two means the demand of this week is zero, right? What is the probability that so the demand of this week is zero, is here, from three, right? So let's check next one, P23. P23 means at the beginning of this week I have two, next week I have three. How can this happen? So if I have no demand, next week I will have two. I have any demand bigger or equal to one, then the ordering policy will be triggered. So next week, so I will have four, right? So which means that this case would not happen. The probability of that is zero. It is not possible that this week I have two, next week I have three. If I have more than two, it must be four, right? According to the policy. So this is zero. Then what is the probability that from two to four. This week I have two, next week I have four. This week will happen as long as the demand is bigger or equal to one. In this case, the ordering policy will be triggered, right? So <coughs> if the demand is bigger or equal to one, so it will be those three cases, add them together, I have point three, right? Not point seven. Here, you can, you can see that if we check those three transition probabilities, these are probabilities from state two to whatever state next step, right? Because uh, from state two, you will always make transitions. So either to two or three or four. So you can see that if we add those three probabilities together, you must have one. Why is so? Because you must make transition. You must tra make transitions to either two or three or four. So from any state, from two to these three states, if you sum up them, sum them up together, it must be equal to one, right? And then let's check next one. What is the probability that we make transition from three to two? Three to two, this week I have three, next week I have two, which means that demand is n, uh, the, the demand is one, so which is uh, point three. From three to three, demand is zero, probability point three. From three to four means that the demand must be bigger or equal to two. Probability is point three, uh, point four. So, again, if you check those three numbers, you add them up together, you have one, right? From state three, you must make transitions to either two or three or four. And uh, from state four, you make transition to two, the demand must be two. Probability is point two. From four to three, demand is one, probability is point three, right? From four to four, you can, of course, you can argue that the demand is either zero or demand is bigger or equal to three, or you can simply one minus point two minus point three, which is point five, right? This is the transition probabilities of this example. So you can see that it only depends on your initial energy level. 
understand the distribution of this, this wheat, the, the, the di distribution of the demand of this wheat, right? So then we know the transition probabilities. Maybe we can think of uh, uh, what will happen at the beginning of uh, week one, right? From week zero to week one. So what's going on? Uh, we know that at the beginning of uh, uh, at zero, uh, at the beginning of week zero, we have four, right? So what is the probability at uh, the beginning of uh, week one? I have two. It is simply, according to the definition, it is simply the transition probability from four to two, right? So you make transition from four to two by one week. So it is equal to this, which is 0.2. So probability that x1 is equal to three is the P43. So x1 is equal to four is a P44, right? So this is uh, the very first step. So we know what's going on from week zero to week one, right? So this is great. And actually, <coughs> so before, before we move on from week one to week two, so I think it's a, a maybe Let's think of uh, what we just described uh, about this, uh, about these transition probabilities, right? Transition probabilities, just uh, as I said, generally speaking, this is just uh, for a general Markov chain. This is just a PIJ, which stands for the probability that I make transition from state I to state J by one step, right? Transition probability. And uh, it would be more convenient to organize all those transition probabilities into a matrix, so which is called transition matrix. So how can we do that? It just uh, so this Pij is the transition probability from state i to state j by one step, right? For for this guy. We just uh, put it in the ith row and jth column in a matrix. So again, half the row, jth column in a matrix. We put all such transition probabilities into a big matrix. And you can see that the dimension of this matrix, so how many rows it has, how many column that has the number of rows and the number of columns must be equal to the space, state space, right? In this example, the state space has uh, three numbers. So for this uh, <coughs> transition matrix, it must be three by three, right? So it looks like that. So here, two, three, four. So the, the index of row, just uh, those three states, states two, states three, states four. And for the column, the first column corresponds to state two, the second column corresponds to state three, and so on, right? So then, in this example, what is this uh, point three? It is just a transition probability from state two to state two. So this one, point four, what is this point four? It's a transition probability from state three to state four. From this row to this column, right? Again, what is the meaning of that? The meaning of that is uh, at the beginning of this week, I have given them that at the beginning of this week, I have three, the probability that next week I have Right? So this is a transition probability. Transition probabilities and uh, <coughs> how to organize them into a transition matrix. 
And this is a, a general case. If we think of a, a, a Markov chain uh, whose state space has M states, M states, maybe we just call them state 1 up to state M, so then the corresponding transition matrix should be an M by M square matrix, right? And uh, so this Pij, which is the entry in the ith row and the jth column, the meaning of that would be the transition probability from state i to state j by one step, right? So this thing is the uh, transition matrix. And again, as I explained just now, because uh, from each state, from the arbitrary state i, you must make transition from two states, one up to m. Because you must make transitions as a as a result, so you you add them together, they must be equal to one. So for this transition matrix, the row sum, the sum of each row must be equal to one. Again, the meaning of that is that from the arbitrary state, you must make transitions in the next step to one state in the state space. So this is a, so the, the, the property a transition matrix must have. So first, because each entry is a probability, each entry must be a number between 0 and 1. And because you must make conditions at each step, the row sum, the sum of each row must be equal to 1. And also, uh, <coughs> we can uh, describe transitions uh, of a Markov chain uh, by using the so-called transition diagram. So the transition diagram is, uh, is very easy to understand. So for example, uh, in our example, we know that it has three states. So we just uh, draw three circles. So those three circles uh, stand for three states. Three states are two, three, and four. So we have uh, three circles for three states. And uh, if it is possible to make transition from one state to one state, then we just uh, draw an arrow. So for example, this uh, it is possible we make transition from two to two, we just draw an arrow from two to itself. And uh, we put a number aside, uh, aside of this arrow, which is the transition probability. And here you can see uh, we can make transitions from 2 to 4 with probability 0.7. So just look like that. And also keep in mind that we just argue that it is not the transition probability to 2 to 3. From 2 to 3 is 0. In this case, we don't bother to draw an arrow because it is not possible to make transition from 2 to 3, right? So <coughs> if you check this transition matrix, you see that it's consistent with this transition diagram. So but those two, those two ways are, are just uh, equivalent. And maybe before we move on, let's consider uh, another another example, and uh, uh, so that I will I will I will I will write down the the transition matrix and transition diagram for this example, so that you can understand them better. So suppose that so this time uh, Tom and Jerry are gambling again, so they they flip a, a fair fair coin. And if the outcome is has, 
Tom wins one dollar, otherwise Jerry wins one dollar. So suppose that uh, at the beginning, both of them have three dollars, right? And uh, they will repeat the game until one of them lose all money. So we can imagine that the end of this game must be either uh, Tom has six dollars or Jerry has uh, six dollars, right? And uh, if we use uh, ZN for the money Tom has after the end game, so find the transition probabilities of uh, uh, of this of this Markov chain. So actually, this one is uh, is pretty simple. So the only thing you need to be a bit careful is that when we talk about a Markov chain, so we use, it means that so this Markov chain must evolve indefinitely. Indefinitely means that so it may have a, a beginning of time, but so we need to suppose that so this Markov chain will evolve. It will not stop. There is not end of time. We just assume that it will evolve indefinitely. But for this example, so the game will stop as long as uh, one of them will lose all the money, right? The game will stop, but the Markov chain will not stop. How can we model this? So. <coughs> The way to model this is to is something like this. Actually, we know that at the end of uh, this game, either Tom has six dollars or has zero dollar, right? So the game stop actually means that after this game, Tom will have either zero or six dollars. To make this Markov chain evolve indefinitely, we may introduce a, a transition like this. At zero state, at state zero, it will always make transition to itself. We'll probably be one. So, and uh, at state six, it will also make transition to itself. We'll probably be one. So essentially, it means that as long as you reach zero or six, you will stay there forever, right? In this way, so it will use that to model the end of the game. The end of the game means you just stay in a state forever. Stay in this game forever, it doesn't mean transition will be stopped. It just means the transition probability to itself will always be one. Right? So that's the way to model <coughs> Markov chain like this. And as long as uh, you can figure this out, I think uh, uh, the remaining stuff will be very simple. So for example, I guess uh, the, the coin is a fair coin. So if you have one dollar, if the Tom has one dollar, then with probability uh, one half, so he will lose one one dollar with probability one half, he will win one dollar. So as a result, make a transition to zero and the two with one half, right? So for other states, all similar. So so it, it, it would just look like that. It's a transition diagram. So that as long as uh, uh, you can you can draw this uh, transition diagram, uh, the transition matrix will be pretty simple. You just put those numbers into uh, a matrix. So here, uh, to be uh, so in order for you to have uh, clearer picture. I just read down so those uh, non-zero entries. So this is a seven by seven matrix. 
but all the empty entries are essentially zero. Right? So, but, but for you to, to clearly see those uh, uh, non zero entries, they just uh, put those uh, non zero entries there for remaining for the uh, empty spaces, essentially they're all zero. So this is the transition uh, matrix of this uh, example. Uh, questions? So if no questions, I think we need to stop here. And uh, next week, uh, I will explain how to how to find the distribution of uh, X2. So see you next week. <laughs>